Hello, Calculus fans. Today we start Chapter 11, which leads to one of the most important things that you will learn in your calculus sequence, which is Taylor series and Maclaurin series. And they're used uh, throughout the math and sciences and engineering uh, fields, as we'll see. But to get started, before we talk about series, we have to talk about sequences. So in chapter 11, the very first section is dedicated to infinite sequences. And then 11.2 to 11.11 .11 are all infinite series. Okay, so we're going to look at sequences first. Because we have to understand what a sequence is before we can understand a series. So to get started, a sequence is a list of numbers written in a definite order. So we've got an example here. This is a sequence. These, these numbers here are called terms of the sequence. And this particular sequence is an arithmetic sequence with a constant difference of 4. An arithmetic sequence is just a, sequ a list of these numbers where you're constantly adding or subtracting. So here, starting at 1, and I just constantly add 4. So there's a definite order here, right? Starting at 1 and the terms just go up by four every time. So you can see they're written in this like set notation like this, but sometimes you can, you can write them without the braces. So you could also, you could write this, this sequence like one, five, nine, 13, 17, and so forth. You could write it that way too without the braces. We've got another sequence here. Now this one is not arithmetic, and it's not an ar arithmetic sequence because we're not adding a constant number, right? We're not adding a constant number here. We're actually multiplying by a constant number. And if you look closely, you can see that to get from here to here, I just multiply by one half. And then from here to here, I multiply by one half. From here to here, I multiply by one half. So this is called a geometric sequence with a ratio of one half. Also, when you look at these these terms of the sequence, sometimes we'll talk about the first term, which is this, second term, which is this, third term, and so forth. So sometimes we have to talk about um, each of these terms. Okay, we've got another couple of sequences here. This one may look familiar to you. We'll talk about this one in a few minutes here. But these two sequences don't fit either of these. They're not arithmetic sequences and they're not geometric sequences. So these are still sequences, but not arithmetic or geometric. So it's not an arithmetic sequence, not a geometric sequence. Uh, but they are sequences. They're numbers written in a definite order. This one you can see, like, if I add these two numbers together, I get 2. And if I add these two numbers together, I get 3. These two, I get 5, and so forth. And this one, it looks like we're just, we keep adding 1, right? 1 plus 1, and then 2 plus 1, 3 plus 1. Same thing over here, we just keep adding 1, all right? Now for the notation here for these sequences, let's look at this sequence right here. So you've got these numbers here. We talked about these being the terms of the sequence. And we can do something else with these terms. So we've got the terms of the sequence. We could write it like this. We could say a sub 1 equals 1. A sub 2 equals 5. A sub 3 equals 9. So it's a notation we can use. This is the first term. A sub 1 is the first term of the, of the sequence. A sub 2 equals 5 means 5 is the second term. Uh, this just means that 9 is the third term and so forth. And this one we can actually come up with what's called the general term. Because we could say that A sub n equals 4 n minus 3. So for this particular sequence, there's a formula for it. So if I want to know, for instance, the second term of the sequence, I just plug a 2 in here. 4 times 2 is 8 minus 3, which is 5. So there's a formula for each one of these 
terms of the sequence right here. Okay. And then for this one right here, if we look at this, the, we look at the terms of the sequence, we can see that a sub 1 is 1 half. a sub 2 is 2 thirds. And if you think about it, you may be able to figure out the general term for this one, a sub n. It looks like it's just n divided by n plus 1. Right? If you play around with this, you can see a sub 1, where well, there's a 1 and there's one more than that. a sub 2, there's a 2 up here, and then this is one more than that. So like a sub 4 would be 4 over 5, and sure enough, here's 1, 2, 3, 4. a sub 4 is 4 over 5. And what these are called, these are called the general term, general term a sub n. Sometimes you can find a formula for the general term, like in these two cases, and sometimes you can't. Also, this general term may look, I mean, it should feel kind of familiar, because if you think about, like, uh, what we're used to with functions, if we had a function, we'd say something like f of x equals 2x plus 1. So this would be a function, and typically here, x would be any real number, right? These x's would be real numbers. So what we're doing now is something similar, but we'll have something like a sub n equals 2n plus 1. And the difference here, we've, where we've got a function here, we've got a sequence here, and these inputs here for the sequence, these are going to be integers, okay? So we've got a function here like we're used to. Here we've got a sequence, but you can see that they're somewhat similar, right? They're, they're the same idea, but again, the inputs here can be any real number. The inputs here will be integers, but they're kind of the same. So there should be, you know, not, not a brand new idea. Okay, then we've got a sequence here, sequence with these terms here. You can denote this sequence a couple of ways. Sometimes you can denote it like this. You put these, these braces. It's the sequence a sub n. And sometimes you'll also do it this way, a sub n. And sometimes people will say like n equals 1 to infinity. You don't really need to do that. Typically you see it like this. But it's basically just the general term enclosed in braces. So sometimes you'll see this denoted this way. So when you see this, you're talking about a sequence. This is a sequence. The general term is enclosed in braces. As I mentioned before, a lot of times these well-defined sequences don't have a general term. So they don't have this general nth term a sub n. So as an example, a very common uh, number pi uh, so if a sub n is the nth decimal place of pi, so let's just take a look at this a second. So we know pi is equal to 3.1415926.5. It just keeps on going, right? We, we know it keeps on going here. We can talk about some of these terms. So we could say, for instance, we could say, all right, a sub 4 equals 5. So let's see, it's 4, 5. So we could also say a sub 7 equals 6. So these are particular terms of the sequence, and these represent the nth decimal place, right? The nth decimal place of pi. So this is the first, second, third, fourth decimal place of pi, and then the fifth, sixth, seventh decimal place of pi. But what if you wanted to find this? What if you wanted a formula for a sub n? a sub n equals, you're looking for a formula, you could just plug in and kick out these numbers here. Or even for this one, for the Fibonacci sequence, which I had mentioned, this is one you've probably seen before or heard of at some point where you add the two previous terms to get the next term. And there's applications of this that occur uh, really all over the place. People um, have found examples of this in the, in the natural world. Some kind of fit better than others, but there's examples of that if you, if you look. And there, if maybe you want to find a formula for this, for the uh, 
the uh, general term a sub n equals, and you're looking for this. Well, unfortunately, these are impossible to find. So don't look for them. Stop looking. They have been shown to be impossible to find. The reason they're impossible is because the explicit definitions for these do not exist. D-N-E. Explicit definitions do not exist. Now, you, there is a recursive definition for the Fibonacci sequence. So I could write this. I could say A sub N is equal to a sub n minus 2 plus a sub n minus 1. This is called a recursive definition. So if I know the previous two, I can find the next one, right? a sub n is the previous one plus the one previous to that previous one, right? So if I know the previous two terms, I can find a sub n. But just to find a formula for a sub n, like if I want to know the formula for like the 23rd number here, it, it, it just doesn't exist. There is no formula for that. Okay, so not all sequences have a general nth term. So there's a theorem in this section that makes life easy for us, for a reason you'll see. And uh, just basically says, <coughs> if the limit of f of x, so this is a function, the limit of this function is x approaches infinity equals l, and also f of n equals a sub n. So here we have a sequence, and if these are equal when n is an integer, then the limit of n approaches infinity of the nth term of the sequence is also l. So <clears throat> let me draw a picture of this and it'll make more sense. If you look at the picture, you can see that the smooth curve here, this is the function. This is f of x, so f of x is going along here. But the sequence, at all these integer inputs, the sequence rides right on the function, right? So the function at an integer is equal to the sequence. So basically the, the output values here, the sequence ride right on the function. So whatever the function does, so as, then, as x approaches infinity, X could be any of the real numbers on this number line, but as the limit, as X approaches infinity of the function equals this number L, and this rides along on the function, then we can also say that the limit of the sequence as N approaches infinity also equals L. So the terms of the sequence ride right on the function. And the reason that that is very helpful to us is the note here. That is really helpful because this allows us to use L'Hopital's rule. Okay, so L'Hopital's rule, if you remember, we really need a continuous function because we have to take derivatives, and we don't have that when we're using these sequences. So because of this theorem, we're going to be able to use it anyway, and you'll see that later on. Basically, this theorem, uh, if you have the 8th edition of the book, in the 8th edition, this is called Theorem 3. And it was on page 697 in the 8th edition. And the 9th edition of the Stuart textbook, is, this is called Theorem 4. And it's on page 728. So if you want to look that uh, up for reference, that's, that's where you'll find it. But the important part is it allows us to use L'Hopital's rule. And as I mentioned, we'll see that uh, later on in this chapter. Okay, when you talk about convergent and divergent sequences... So if we've got this infinite sequence, and see how this one is just the general term and closed in, in the braces, so this means it's a sequence. It's a convergent sequence if the limit is n approaches infinity of a sub n equals l. L is just some number. So it says here where l is an element of the real number system, right? So l is just some number, so it can't be infinity. Remember this notation for an element of. And then this script r just means real numbers. So basically that means this. So as we go along these, we have these integer inputs again, right? So our outputs will these, be these, these points. So it would be something like this. So we're, we're going out, uh, we're looking at these integer inputs, and we're getting something like this. 
So we could cross over this. We don't have to, but we could. But we can see that this is getting closer and closer and closer to L. So we can, we can make a sub n be as close to L. We can make a term of this sequence be as close to L as we want if we just go out far enough. Right, so it's it's sort of like the limit value that we use all the time uh, in calculus. So if we can do that, it just means the sequence is converging. If we can get this, these uh, numbers to be as close as we want to this number L, then the sequence converges. Okay, so we can make the, the terms of the sequence as close to L as we like by taking N sufficiently large. Okay, now on the other hand, an infinite sequence, a sub n, is a divergent sequence if, when we take the limit, the limit is n approaches infinity of a sub n does not exist. If that limit does not exist, it's said to be divergent. So usually what happens is you take the limit and you get plus or minus infinity. <clears throat> but also it could be something where it just oscillates indefinitely and never approaches any one number. So I'll just say this oscillates indefinitely, etc. So some other reason the limit just doesn't exist, then we say the sequence is divergent. But normally it'll be like you take the limit and you get a some sort of infinity. Now a lot of times in pre-calc you'll study finite sequences, sequences in series, finite ones. So you go to some number and so i equals like 1 to 50 or something like that. In calculus, we move to the infinite sequences in series, so there'll be limits involved. Okay, so some of this may be familiar if you studied uh, finite sequences in series in pre-calc. But this, this is what we need to know about sequences. So if we just know this about sequences, uh, then we'll be ready to go to learn about series. And the rest of the chapter 11 is all about series, but we'll refer back to this section occasionally um, as we're working on the, on the series. So that is all we need for 11.1, and let's move on to 11.2.